Okay, what I think I'm going to start. Um, first of all, uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the meeting, uh, to the seminar, should I say. Uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Professor Mohalaka Fleischmann, I'd like to uh, welcome you to this talk. Uh, she's on the call, but unable to um, unmute, so she uh, asked me to pass on her greetings and welcome you to the seminar. And um, so I think without more ado, I'm going to address, um, uh, welcome our guest, um, whom I know as Mags, and even her email knows her as Mags, uh, <laughs> but Professor Blackie. Uh, she's uh, now currently at um, Rhodes University, where she shifted, is it this year or end of last year? Halfway through last year. Halfway through last year. And uh, she's working now specifically in um, knowledge building and curricula at higher education. So I think that's a very important aspect of, of what we do. She is a chemist, which means that I like her because she's a chemist. <laughs> uh, she holds a PhD in education from Stellenbosch University and a PhD in chemistry from the University of Cape Town. So she's got uh, PhDs jointly in both P in education and chemistry. Um, and she's one of these chemists who's been interested enough to join us in science education. And she's very welcome. So she's currently at the Centre for Higher Education Research, Teaching and Learning at Rhodes University. And uh, she was the recipient of the Saki Medal in 2020 for chemical education, uh, remembering that uh, there was this sort of blank period where people got medals and they didn't get presented with them because of the pandemic. And um, she was awarded a university teaching award in the distinguished category also in 2020. And um, today she's going to address us on creating a curriculum for knowledge building. And I'll ask her now to share her slides. And um, I'm going to give her about 40 minutes uh, so that we have enough time to question. Um, and she's also very keen to hear your questions. So please go ahead and share your slides, Mags. Great. OK, um, can you see that all right? And can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. OK, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It, it's always wonderful to be invited to give such talks. And I find it's also very useful to give such talks because it makes me think about it um, in, in a new way as I present it to, to new audiences. So my understanding is that uh, the sort of the invitation has come from those of you who are teaching within the extended uh, degree program, but it will apply more generally across the board, but that's the focus uh, for uh, commerce and uh, science extended degree um, program. Th that, that's who I think I was, I was, I'm speaking to. So um, my talk is geared towards that, but it, it's obviously more widely applicable as you will see. So, um, just to begin with this notion of curriculum. So this is, uh, obviously I just Googled define curriculum and this was one of the things that came up. Um, and the answer here, curriculum is a standards-based uh, sequence of planned experiences where students practice and achieve proficiency in content and applied learning skills. So when we think about curriculum, particularly within the sciences, and I'm guessing the same is true, uh, particularly within accounting or economics or any of those very much knowledge centered fields, that the first thing we think about is what knowledge are we trying to teach? What are we trying to get across? And the examples, as Marissa said, I am a chemist. So many of my examples in this talk will be from chemistry. But uh, hopefully I'll be descriptive enough that you will see the application beyond chemistry. So in terms of chemistry, the first thing we think about in terms of the curriculum is the textbook, right? Let's pick a textbook. And again, this is a random picture of Google of a, a 
an introductory chemistry textbook. And the second thing that we often think about is what's happening in the um, and I know that uh, some people at UP have been doing very interesting things with respect to chemistry practice in particular. Um, but it, it essentially is looking at what are we going to teach? And then if we think a little bit more broadly about curriculum, we may also begin to think about issues around pedagogy, things like how are we going to teach this stuff? So normally when we're thinking about uh, curriculum, the, the, our two major priorities are the content that we're going to teach and the kind of pedagogy that we're going to use. And all of that, sort of that focus, uh, uh, I myself and Kriti took that as a reasonable focus for many years until that uh, say memorable experience in 2015, 2016, of uh, the fees must fall the combination of protests, and in particular, the call there for um, decolonizing. And initially, my response to the call for decolonization was very much like uh, that of many of my colleagues in science saying, well, decolonization, that, that's, not really, um, that's not really for us. And that, that argument really came through when the Science Must Fall video um, went viral. For those of you who don't remember it, it was a four or five minute from a larger meeting that was that happened at UCT. And this young student who is here uh, pictured, I think, if I recall, she was a social science student, um, but basically said in the in the heat of this quite emotional meeting said we need to throw out Newton and start all over again. And unsurprisingly, there was a very strong response from uh, the science com community saying, don't be ridiculous. Science is objective. There's got the whole call for decolonization and science is ridiculous. This like just actually go away. However, I, uh, at that stage, was uh, working quite closely with Hanley Ardendorf, who is still at Stellenbosch, and she and I began to work on thinking around what decolonization might look like in science. And ultimately, that led me to developing, um, it, that's, it's kind of, the, that was the, the tipping point that, that led me ultimately to, to do the second PhD. Um, but I think what happens in knowledge-centric uh, fields like the sciences or commerce uh, or medicine um, is that, or certainly engineering, is that we can often overlook the importance of the person who is studying. And that's where actually a broader conception of the curriculum becomes important. And here, turning... Uh, to the work of Basil Bernstein, this conceptualization by Basil Bernstein, who is a British sociologist of education, um, I find quite helpful. And that's the, the, the uh, distinction between what he calls the instructional discourse and the regulative discourse. Don't worry about those fancy terms. Essentially what he's talking about there, the instructional discourse is what we teach and assess. So... Uh, in terms of chemistry, when we're thinking about teaching chemistry, we're always going to teach the periodic table. That's not really up for grabs. Um, we can't teach a good chemistry course without teaching the atom. Um, but what that argument that science is objective, therefore decolonization has nothing to do with science, fails to address is the notion of the regulative discourse. And that's the social environment of, um, in which the teaching takes place. And, and the reason that we tend to overlook that is because of this notion that science is objective and therefore who you are doesn't matter. We forget that actually our whole classroom setting the examples that we use, all of those sorts of things, frame the social setting of our teaching. So in terms of the instructional discourse, 
Um, in terms of teaching chemistry, is there, and, and chemistry is a particular example here, because it, uh, it grew up sort of with the, uh, with the period of the Enlightenment and, and then the, the period of colonization, it grew up sort of simultaneously with that as precision balances were um, uh, devised. We're not going to alter the content of chemistry terribly much, but... When we think more broadly in terms of thinking about the, the, uh, the social environment, the question we have to ask ourselves is, is there a normative life world that is presented? One of the examples that, that always gets used, um, talking about molecular rotation, one of the examples that, that gets used in chemistry a lot is the example of an ice skater. An ice skater, when they have their arms out, is will rotate at a particular rate, and when they pull their arms in, um, will rotate more quickly. And this is a great example of explaining some issues associated with molecular rotation. Now, that's a very good example if you're living in Europe or North America. Um, it's not a very good example if you're living in South Africa, and particularly now I'm teaching at Rhodes, um, sort of in the Eastern Cape, where most students, many students would never have had any experience of being on ice. So one of the things that one really can do to ensure that, uh, that there is a change in terms of normative life world, and one of the things that, that I do a lot in my own teaching is to say, this is an example that makes sense to me. This is an example that I would use. Now, what are some of the examples from your own life experience that might illustrate the same thing? And I get students to talk to one another about that and then say okay let's hear some of these examples and some of them may be fantastic and some of them may really not be fantastic it doesn't really matter I can then say to them this is a great and here's why or that won't work and here's why the point there is that it makes very clear to the student that I'm drawing on my lived experience to inform my understanding of a particular concept. So uh, the student doesn't need to understand my, my life world, but they need to begin to think about how they can draw on their life world. And that's, that really does go a long way um, towards the process of kind of thinking about decolonization in, um, in science teaching. So I think, um, just uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look, I'm, I'm going to switch for the rest of the talk to look at knowledge building in particular, but I just want to frame knowledge building within this bigger structure of the combination of the instructional discourse and the regulative discourse. We need to pay attention to the regulative discourse because that, that if students are saying that they experience alienation, it's because of the regulative discourse. Obviously, in, in certainly, and I'm talking here about sort of the sciences or accounting or things like that, we're not going to radically change what we teach necessarily uh, because the subjects have a particular, the, the knowledge that we need to build within those subjects is particular and universal. Uh, but that doesn't mean we've got nothing to do. So just to just to hold that within the in the in the bigger thought, and um, just to point towards uh, there's a reference there to a paper in the International Journal of Critical Diversity Studies where I really pull out um, that in 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 much more detail. So if you're interested in that idea, you can go to that paper and have a look at that. Um, the second thing that, that becomes important in terms of the instructional discourse is alignment, right? We need to have some alignment between the stated outcomes and what we, what we are assessing. So as a ridiculous example, if the outcome, one of the outcomes of our course is the ability to tie shoelaces and with trying to think about how we might assess that, and we've got two options, one is tying shoelaces and the other is writing an essay on fastening shoes. I think it's fairly clear which of those assessments is most closely aligned with the outcome. 
right? If we want, if we claim that this course uh, will enable people to tie shoelaces, then it seems fairly obvious that assessing their tying of shoelaces would be a better, more aligned assessment than writing an essay on fastening shoes, for example. So we've got to ensure that there is alignment there, but alignment in itself is not sufficient. Um, and there's a uh, one of our doctoral students here at Churtle um, is doing a wonderful study on um, an accounting course where the the outcomes and the assessment are beautifully aligned, but it's all at the level of procedural knowledge. And I'll explain what I mean in a minute by procedural knowledge. Um, none of the assessment points to whether the students are actually understanding the underlying principle behind those procedures. So the alignment between we, we will not be assessing our course adequately if it's not aligned with what we're teaching in the course. So alignment is essential, but alignment in itself, so it's necessary but not sufficient um, to create a, a curriculum for, for knowledge building. One thing that we do need to realize is that uh, certainly within the South African school system, I don't know the, the school system intimately myself. I've neither been through it and I, I don't have children going through it, but my perception of um, a lot of what happens in the school system is some version of, of, of exam training. And essentially, uh, what happens there is, again, let's take the hypothetical uh, metric question of tying shoes, and then the exam training is, can you tie different shoes? Um, and all of that, none of that builds towards this notion that actually what we're doing, the principle of what we're doing here is learning how to, in this first instance, fasten shoes, but more broadly, tie a knot of some kind. And so our students don't know, I, I, I don't think that the, the secondary schooling system necessarily sets students up well to understand that there is something deeper that they need to look for. So part of our job is thinking about how to make that visible to them. So there are two things, the, the, the focus really of this talk is, is then thinking about how do we conceptualize knowledge? And there are two examples that I have here. One is we're not, if you think about any of the content that you teach at an undergraduate level, most of that content, sadly, most of the content that we teach, the student is not going to use directly, certainly is not going to use directly in that form. Um, so they have to be able to do two different things. The first one is transfer that knowledge to a new uh, but related system, right? So if I can tie a bow in my shoes, I can probably learn, one might as one would hope, I, I can learn to tie a bow in my hair, okay? So that would be knowledge transfer. And that's often the issue with um, certainly first year uh, service courses. Often you hear complaints about, um, again, particularly thinking about chemistry, uh, people from biochemistry saying, oh, students just don't really understand pH. They don't understand about acids and bases. Um, and chemists will say, but we teach them. And the issue there is one of transfer. The student can't transfer their knowledge in, in one zone into, into another space. And if one has been taught uh, simply through kind of an exam training model, then of course transfer is going to be difficult. The second thing we need to think about in terms of um, knowledge is abstraction. Can I uh, 
create a set of rules, for example, to describe how to how to tie um, how to tie shoelaces, or can I can I create some kind of algorithm for that, which is the going to the more uh, overarching thing of what is this knowledge actually doing? What's the underlying principle behind this thing that I've learned to do? Um, and so that's really, uh, I just want to focus on ways in which we can then drill down into thinking about that for particular subjects. So this, uh, this idea comes from Sue Ellen Shea was a, um, she was the Dean of the Center for Higher Education and Development at UCT for a number of years. Um, and really was a key player in, in the South African higher education um, when it came to thinking about curriculum and knowledge. This uh, illustration comes out of a, a book chapter uh, that she wrote along with uh, three other people um, in 2011, uh, building on John Gam Gamble's work of the separation between procedural knowledge and conceptual knowledge. And what sits above that diagram there is the crucial thing that procedural knowledge does not lead to conceptual knowledge and conceptual knowledge does not lead to procedural knowledge. The point there is that just because somebody can, uh, has figured out how to trans, in terms of the image that I've just uh, used, abstraction doesn't necessarily enable transfer and transfer doesn't imply abstraction in terms of the, the uh, bow tying illustration that, that I've just used. That's, that's another way of saying um, what they've said in this paper. And I think the, the really important thing here is that when I go back to that, the, the illustration that I was saying of our doctoral student who's studying this accounting course, um, saying essentially what, what's happening is that there's beautiful alignment of outcomes saying students will be able to uh, carry out these procedures and the assessment, that's exactly what they're doing. But without some kind of abstraction, without some kind of understanding the principle involved, the, the concepts involved, um, there, there is no guarantee that students will be able to take that into either transfer that to a new situation um, and the new situation could be in the world of work um, or that they're not going to be able to figure out how to apply that in a new way. So certainly what, what I've discovered in chemistry, and this is much to my shame, I, I taught chemistry um, for a good decade at uh, tertiary level before figuring this out is that we conflate procedural competence with understanding the underlying principles. So in chemistry, what that an example would be is a thing that we ask students to do is to balance a chemical equation. And we presume that they then understand the conservation of matter that the, they have to balance the, the, the equation. The reason that they have to balance it, the reason balancing an equation works is because matter can neither be created nor destroyed. But unless we actually test that they've grasped that underlying principle, we don't know that they've actually understood it. So, um, the other thing that, that's important here, going back to the hair tying example, is that what we can do at university, we think we're a little bit smarter than they are at school. We decide that actually exam training in quite the way that they do at school is, is you know, we're going to be more sophisticated than that. We're going to make sure that students can transfer their knowledge. And we presume that if they can transfer the knowledge, it must mean that they understand the abstraction. So if they can use the procedural knowledge in a new context, that we take that as a proxy for them being able to understand the principle. And we have no evidence that that holds. So again, I think we've got to make, we've got to think about how 
we make the underlying principle visible to the students and how we make looking for the underlying principle visible for the students. Another thing, another way of thinking about knowledge structures is this notion of hierarchical and horizontal knowledge structures. Um, again, this is a notion that comes to us from Bernstein. Chemistry, particularly if you think about first year chemistry, it is very hierarchical. One concept builds on another concept, builds on another concept, builds on another concept. So if you, if you didn't get atomic structure, you're probably not going to make it through first year chemistry. Mathematics, each branch of mathematics is likewise hierarchical, but one doesn't need to understand algebra to understand geometry. So mathematics um, and, and physics, for example, is also a little bit like this. You don't need, you can understand waves very well, um, but have very little understanding of Newton's laws and still be able to, you know, get by on, on all. So it has different kinds of knowledge that, that or different kinds of uh, small hierarchies within this body of knowledge that we know as physics. And I think um, other, others, uh, I, I'm guessing commerce uh, would work like this. I'm guessing microeconomics and macroeconomics are, are gonna be uh, two different hierarchical structures, for example. Um, so thinking about, the, the crucial thing about this is we need to think about what students arrive with and what they're building towards. So what, what are the underlying principles they need to take with them on into whatever else is going to follow? So if it's an extended degree program, what do they really need to prepare them um, to, to engage with second year, for example? Um, and to think, quite to think quite carefully about that. And to think not just about the knowledge, but to think about how students are engaging with that knowledge. Again, remembering that they've come from very much an exam training system where they're entering university and now our expectation is that they would be much more uh, self-motivated and more able to figure out what they know and what they don't know. Uh, oftentimes you find that the, the, particularly with weaker students, the issue is that they, they don't even know where they stuck. Um, so really helping, helping make these things visible to students can be very useful. So one of the um, things that, that I've done in chemistry is developing um, what I've called the epistemic assessment framework. There's a whole bunch of uh, theory behind this, which I'm not going to go into. The, the theoretical foundation is laid out in that paper that's uh, given at the bottom there in Foundations of Chemistry that was published at the beginning of last year. Um, essentially looking at the different kinds of knowledge that we require from the student. So there is in chemistry uh, what I call vocabulary. It's stuff that you just need to learn. Um, and it's stuff that that's, the vocabulary could be learned by anybody. Uh, but making students learn that vocabulary then helps put the building blocks into the foundation that they're going to need uh, in order to, to, to get to the principled knowledge, which is really what, where we want to get to. Then there's simple procedures and complex procedures. That th The difference between those is really the length, um, whether there's one step or multiple steps. So that's knowing how to do things. The principle is knowing why. What is the concept that's at the heart of this thing. The examples there won't mean much to you if you're not a chemist, um, but uh, what you can do is take the first, um, the first column and the last column there and think for yourself, okay, what might these different categories look like within the context of my course? Um, and a
can they apply this knowledge to a new scenario? And that's a scenario that they have not been taught in the context of the course. Uh, and you can ask me a question about that uh, later, uh, later on if you want to. But what, what this um, assessment framework gives us then, there, there are two things that this does. One, in terms of teaching, having developed this framework, I find myself much more in my teaching saying, okay, this is the underlying principle here. Here are some examples. Remember, this is the underlying principle here. Here are the examples. Remember, this is the underlying principle. So I make that much more explicit in my teaching. Um, and we, we have found, we did a, a study of uh, students who had been through a second year chemistry course um, at Stellenbosch. And we found that in fact, students, so we would label, we would label all of our exam tutorial and exam questions with the, these categories. And we found that students, not all students, but uh, probably 20 or 30% of the students um, were then approaching their other subjects. So would say, okay, I'm, I'm understanding physics better now because I know that I have to look for the underlying principle. So students, we presume students are gonna be able, would see this, but they don't necessarily. So making this visible within the context of one course can really help them um, in the context of other courses. The other thing that, that this um, looking at kind of knowledge in, in this way helps us to do is differentiated assessments. So the vocabulary, you can say it's vocabulary. You just need to learn this. It's road learning. You have to get 80% for this. Having learned that stuff, it then lowers the cognitive burden when they're answering a normal closed book test or, or, or whatever, because they, they know they have that under their belt, if you like. Procedures are probably still going to be a closed book test. Principle, you can think about multiple ways of assessing um, principles. Um, new problems, maybe best to have an open book sort of scenario there, depending on how you want to ask that kind of thing. So the other advantage of this is that it also helps, um, it helps students begin to see where the gaps are for them. It also helps students begin to uh, recognize if, if different students are performing, you know, some students perform very well on a closed book test, but to have a variety of different kinds of assessments um, can then can then help more students who don't necessarily do well on a closed book test. Again, I can answer more um, qu questions associated with that. But the point here is that if you have a good idea of the knowledge, the kinds of knowledge, how knowledge is built within your particular subject, then you can begin to develop your your whole curriculum structure can hang off the knowledge structure, uh, which then gives epistemic access, gives access to more equitable access um, to students because you're making it more visible to them. The final point I want to make, and then I'll open, open the floor to questions, is are we teaching the knowledge or are we teaching knowledge building? And I think, for, for me, I, I would argue very strongly that we must focus on knowledge building. That is what will prepare our students for lifelong learning. If we're simply teaching them the knowledge, we have to admit that, so again, taking chemistry as an example, when I was teaching at Stellenbosch, we had maybe 60 people in our third year undergraduates who are majoring in chemistry. Who, who did who graduated with a degree in chemistry, of whom maybe 20 would go on to do honors. So the other 40 may never use the content of chemist, the content that we've taught them. They may never teach, they may never use that knowledge again. And then what is the value of the degree? Right? If we're teaching knowledge building, then we must teach the knowledge accurately, right? 
knowledge building implies that you are attaining the knowledge, right? So I'm not saying we don't need to worry about what we're teaching them. We absolutely need to worry about the content, but we also need to make visible what it is to grow in one's understanding. And for example, in that uh, schema uh, that I showed, I'll just go back to it here. If, for example, on a test in a in a test, a student can see, can go back and say, "Okay, I'm reviewing my test. I see that I'm I've got all the vocabulary questions. I've got all the procedural knowledge, but I'm missing the principle." Then, flip, I've got to work to like this. There's, there's something missing in terms of my understanding, and so they know what they need to do. For another student, so two students may get 60%, right? The first one is missing, is has got all the vocabulary, all the procedures, but is missing the underlying principle. The second student is getting all the principal questions and most of the procedural questions, but is missing the vocabulary. It's very easy for them to boost their marks. All they need to do is learn the vocabulary. So it makes visible to the student what they need to do in order to master the subject. So just going back then, sort of finishing off then, um, is looking at when we're thinking about the curriculum, it isn't just what we're going to teach. I think we really need to take a step back and say, what is the kind of knowledge we're teaching and how do we do that most effectively? So again, one of the issues in chemistry is linking what they do in the lab to what they do in the lecture theater. How are we creating those, um, those connections? So I'm going to finish off now. If anyone's interested in any of this work, it's sort of dotted around in, in these several papers. Um, you can, it's really the work over the last two or three years. Um, will show up. This book, Enhancing Science Education, uh, for any of you who are interested in um, this book is a very good illustration of uh, one can use legitimation code theory to help you thinking about the structure of knowledge in your course in the biological sciences and the medical sciences. Um, so uh, do have a look at that. Um, and I will just say thank you very much. If you want to get hold of me and ask me about how you might think about this in terms of your, your particular subject, feel free, there's my email, and I will stop sharing and we can start actually having a conversation. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was really, I found it very interesting um, and I do have some of the background, but I really found some ways forward for some of my tasks, which I have right now. So thank you very oh, much wonderful. for your wonderful talk. Um, there was a hand up right at the beginning and um, uh, Teams doesn't give me the opportunity to send a personal message. So I don't know if that person still has their hand up. Sabelo Ngumalo, I think it was. Uh, you had a question at the beginning. Do you want to ask that question now? If not, um, I'll give you a chance to think and maybe you can put up your hand again. Um, right, so I'm opening up now. Any questions uh, from the floor? Just give a minute or two to you to think, uh, think your way through them. I thought that... Uh, Badge's presentation did generate a lot of interesting questions and particularly to move from your discipline into perhaps chemistry or whatever it is. Uh, you can uh, either ra raise your hand or put something in the chat. Well, uh, while they're trying to come up with questions, I can. Uh, the question that intrigues me most is the notion of transfer. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work about um, uh, uh, the no, um, legitimate peripheral participation. That's uh, sort of learning communities of practice and learning. Um, yeah, the references didn't come straight up in my head, but what mm. did emerge in the work around that is that um, transfer is a very difficult thing to naturally occur or make it happen. Mm. So, for example, one of the pieces of work in that area is um, there were children selling sweets in the streets in Brazil. And they were not in school. Mm. So they would. Um, but they seemed to know they had to go and sell their sweets or their fruit, go and get get the money and then work out how much to buy, how much to package and what to charge for the sweets once they'd packaged them. Mm -hmm. So the person who was doing this research was a mathematics education researcher. And he, the interesting thing is some of them were in school and the ones who were in school were not performing well in school. And this right. seemed to be quite a complex arithmetical operation that they were doing. So the research really tried to find out how they were thinking about these problems of how many they sold, how to package, what to charge. And they seem to have a completely different way of working things out to the way that was taught in school. Um, but this issue of transfer seems to be a very thorny one that doesn't occur naturally. Mm -hmm. so that you've yeah. got to know where they are so you can sort of let them see the similarities or differences. So I just mm -hmm. wondered if you've had any experience trying to work for transfer. Yeah, so I haven't I haven't spent a, a, a lot of time um, focusing on that myself, but I think it is a major issue. And again, I, I guess... My take on that would be to say if we can, if we're teaching for knowledge building, then the student is more likely to be able to identify it, it, where, where they're getting stuck. If they can identify where they're getting stuck, they may be able to identify how to solve their, their current problem in a current situation. But if we're simply teaching, you need to learn how to do this thing, then we're not setting them, we're, we're reducing the probability that they're going to be able to transfer. Uh, so I, I think all we can do with transfer is to create conditions where transfer is more likely to be possible rather than that transfer will occur, if that makes sense. And by putting out the main idea, or the big idea that you're trying to get across. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Oh, here we have Janine. Uh, Janine, would you like to ask your question? Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I follow half of it with um, from um, Mabato's screen because I had connection problems. But what I like the most is that part you say that your example when you were at university, you were about 60, only maybe 20 carry on of them. The chemistry and the others, they didn't know, maybe they were not going to use that chemistry anymore. Marisa, you know better with this, um, we, we were trying to, with our selection, we want to find out what the student wants and then what they want to bring, uh, if they really want to be in this particular uh, path. Isn't this a commonality? People, they study for studying and um, uh, engage in a study field. They don't have much knowledge about it. And then it becomes a problem as well. And then here, if our FSA could be in the venue, could say that, yeah, that's why we need to know. Why am I studying? And that's inner motivation if I'm here because I need to study and understand. I love this degree, then I'll excel. I don't know if at any places, because we're trying to see the extended curriculum student, where can they go? We're trying to find the pathway, the most suitable pathway. Are we doing for ourselves to make it easier? Or is this, again, the background knowledge, the knowledge that is when they're bringing with, 
when do we start questioning that? How do we get it clear so that we can build on that knowledge they bring to us? Yeah, I think there, there are a number of important points there. I think the having, um, <sighs> I think, unfortunately, in the, in the current situ situation, there, there will always be a number of students, a, a good number of students who start off on a degree and, and end up to pursue it because that's the track that they're on. I think there, again, if we're, if we're much more cognizant of teaching for knowledge building, the degree will still have value because the, the learning how to learn uh, is then that is absolutely a transferable skill. Mm. Um, if we're saying you you have to do this and that this is going to give you a job in chemistry, I, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure, to be honest. True, I agree. Um, because that you know there's some jobs, uh, particularly with now the the notion of generative AI tools, there's some jobs that are highly skilled jobs that are simply going to be outsourced to AI. Um, and it's not quite clear what those, you know, we're, we're in that transition phase at the moment of not being clear how this is going to go. But again, teaching for knowledge building um, will make our degrees more valuable for our students, even if they don't want to do the thing that they're studying. Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Max. And Faith has re rescued me. Is sitting in this position, stuff just go out of my head. It's um, situated cognition that I was talking about uh, and the, the perspective. Now, situation cognition theorists actually say you don't get automatic transfer. So um, I just want to see, um, I've got, I think, two more hands. Um, let me just see if I get, yes. Um, I'm going to start with Lynn and then Dr. Gundo. Yeah, thanks. First, a comment on the transfer. And I think we 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 demonstrated too seldom. And Mags, your example of the ice skater and asking them to bring what they understood and know to it is already starting to help create an opportunity to bridge knowledge out of your pure academic context. And I, I think that would be really valuable to keep in mind your example of how to bridge what they already know or their, their mm. situation into their learning um, to mm. make that transfer. But my question is um, in the, the, the understanding, the abstraction um, and the principles and how, mm -hmm. how to assess or gauge when they are developing principled knowledge. Because when it comes to abstraction, we tend to do the abstraction for them. We're going back and forth between our abstract models and an example. And um, if we ask them to explain what they understand, then we tend to get what we've explained to them back again. So, so how do you um, tackle that challenge? Yeah, so if I can put this in... Uh, I'm just going to give a chemistry example and then I'll elaborate on it. So, for example, if, if we're asking them to talk about resonance, we've spoken about um, um, what we can then say is what are the implications for quinoline, for example. So we haven't explained quinoline in class, but then get them to say, based on your understanding of resonance, what do you think might happen in this case? Um, so, especially, again, it's asking them to look at something that they have learned in class, but to say, you know, explain to me what, what this is, honestly, is a little bit unfamiliar to them, um, would, be, would be one of the ways to do that. Uh, and there, and there, there are various other very various other examples for that. I think it's very much the figuring out how to ask those principal questions is trial and error, and 
uh, is very much dependent on almost the subfield uh, that that you're that you're focusing on. But I think it's essential because if we're not testing that stuff, we're not making the underlying principle visible to the students. Um, but it 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 is challenging. But I think it's it's we we need to challenge ourselves to do it. Thank you. Uh, let's go over to Dr. Gundo. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. I come from the uh, health background and uh, originally I'm from Malawi. Um, mm -hmm. And I come from an institution where um, the use of uh, Bloom's taxonomy is emphasized uh, mm -hmm. so that the students are able to apply or analyze information. Uh, so I just want to learn from you as we talk about teaching for knowledge building. Um, what has been your experience with the use of the Bloom uh, taxonomy? If you are familiar with, with it, would you recommend it uh, when it comes to teaching for knowledge building? Thank you. So I th thanks. That's a great question, Dr. Gunda. I'm so I so appreciate you bringing that up. The the issue for me with Bloom's taxonomy is that it doesn't necessarily make the distinction between procedural knowledge and principled knowledge. And so, so, which is why I developed the epistemic assessment framework. It was that, that lack of distinction within blooms for me, um, I, I needed something that would be more directly applicable to the knowledge structure. And then within that, you can you can apply Bloom's taxonomy to to the way in which one is asking the question. Um, but I found this much more useful, not just in assessments, but in terms of teaching and making again making knowledge building visible to the student. I have not been able to do that effectively simply using Bloom's taxonomy. So Bloom's is useful. I, I like I don't want to dis Bloom's at all. It is useful. But to me it's it's limited in terms of the kind of knowledge building that's required in chemistry in particular. Uh, thanks for that um, th those answers to those questions. Um, are there any other questions that anybody would like to ask? Uh, I think there's something in the chat. I'll just have a look again. Uh, Lynn just said thanks. Um, oh, I think another hand has gone up. Uh, it's Faith. Please go ahead, Faith. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much for a very informative um, presentation. And mine is not a question, but just a comment that as you were talking, you made me to think of a an article by Andrew North Edge. I actually looked for it. I'm looking at it as I speak to you now. It's and the article is rethinking teaching in the context of diversity. Andrew North mm -hmm. Edge, he wrote it to 2003. And what oh. he says there, he very much supports what you're saying in that. And I think in that knowledge building that you are talking about, it's according to him, it's now encouraging and enhancing um, students' development and into joining the communities, I think, that Prof was talking about, in that they are now becoming aware of the discourse because we are not only looking at, um, you know, the traditional ways of teaching, um, but we are addressing that by saying we are not the only ones that have this knowledge. Students have got knowledge to bring with. And at the same time, we have to allow them to participate. And if they are able to begin to answer the principal questions, then they are beginning to access the discourse of, of the discipline. So I just thought I'll, 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 I'll share that um, you, you brought that to mind that um, um, uh, Andrew North Edge is talking about rethinking teaching in the context of diversity and he questions what is knowledge and he continues to talk about what you're referring to as social challenges of academic discourse. You mentioned it in the beginning when you were talking about the social aspects because I was writing the social environment which influences students frames of reference. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much for that. I just thought I'd make um, that comment. Thanks. Thanks. For that. Do you want to respond, uh, Margaret? No, Faith, thank you for that. Um, would it be possible just to put the title of that uh, paper the, and the I'll author in the chat? Yes, thank I'll you. do that. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think we're just about out of time. So uh, I don't know if anybody else has got a burning question. Um, but uh, so I can just wait and see if there's another question from the audience. And just wait for me to finish first off as well. No, no, I'm not going to chuck you all out in the next minute. <laughs> um, what I wanted to conclude by saying was that I think that obtaining that transfer is the gold standard, really. Mm. When you, I mean, when you do a piece of research and you manage to show that there's been transfer, I mm. think because of those findings by the situated cognition researchers, you feel like you've really made uh, made a you know got a gold star so to speak um right. and one place where we did see that happen is um my ex phd student who's now a professor of chemical education elizabeth mavunga did yes. some research um where she taught the students how to unpack a topic in teaching using uh, pedagogical content knowledge in such a way that um, could they could they do it with another topic? And this did happen. She she showed them how to do this. Then they went out on teaching practice and they had to teach other topics. And they were able to use her strategy to unpack other teaching topics for teaching, which right. I think is 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 something that shows there was some findings. And mm. thank you to um, Faith, who has now put the title of that book into the chat. It's an um, article. Uh, 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 sorry, is it an article? I beg your yes. pardon. Um, so uh, if you look in the chat, you will find that she's... Um, Rethinking she's Teaching in the Context of Diversities by Andrew North Edge. And uh, just for the rest of you, Teaching in Higher Education is a very nice journal to... Um, to use for stuff because they have some really interesting articles. And what I would do with Andrew Northedge's article is put it into Google Scholar, look who cited him, and you'll be able to find more free, more recent stuff that draws on that thinking. Mm. So that's a piece of advice. Um, okay, so um, I think on that note, um, I, I think this uh, is being recorded. So, yes, it is. So there will be a recording available um, of uh, Mags's presentation. So it just remains for me to say thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Um, it was really great. And I think you managed to take something very highly complex mm. and put it into a form that people who are not into sort of educational stuff. I mean, if you read Bernstein, he's highly complicated. So uh, what she's managed to do is make it accessible to a non-education audience, which I think is a real achievement. So uh, maybe what I would like you to do is to take your reactions uh, and please give her a, a hand. Um, I'm not sure where the applause thing is. Uh, I know where it is in Zoom. But uh, oh, others do. <laughs> so uh, thank you very, very much. And at the um, top there, Prof, where there's a smiling face, if you click on it, I it react. will give you different options and there yeah. are the hands. Well, I'm going to use a different one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just to say to everybody, we have some talks coming in May. Uh, one is on language and it has been fixed. Um, I'm busy working on another one from some people in the USA, so uh, please keep that open. Uh, the dates that should be the 10th of May, the 7th of May, 17th of May, and the 31st of May are the forthcoming dates. So with that, I think we can close the seminar, and thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Thank Thanks. you so much. Much appreciated.